Hey everybody, welcome to the 10% True Podcast. Quick message from me before you get stuck in. This podcast is free, so there's no advertising. I don't monetize it on YouTube. You don't have to sit through any annoying adverts, and I don't even ask for any money through Patreon. But if you could, in exchange for that, drop me a like, leave a comment, share my content, and if you're listening to the podcast version, maybe leave a review of the channel, that would be hugely appreciated. It will help me to grow my audience, which is really what I'm trying to achieve. Anyway, with that, I'll let you get back to listening. Enjoy. Danny, welcome to 10% True. Thanks for coming onto the channel. Well, glad to be here. Uh, you know, your timing is right to be able to talk to uh, F-105 pilots. Uh, uh, Father Clock is not kind to people that uh, move into their elder years, and I'm, you know, very quickly moving into that category. Uh, matter of fact, when I was uh, young, my dad asked me, uh, what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I told him I wanted to be a fire pilot. He says, that's, you can't be both. You got to choose, you know? So, so uh, I was lucky enough to uh, uh, get into flying airplanes and, and uh, I, I, my undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering and uh, went off to pilot training in uh, June of uh, 1964 and uh, graduated with my Air Force Silver Wings in, in June of 1965 and uh, very shortly moved on to what that time was called the Air Defense Command. And uh, those, some of those missions are still here, but most of them have long gone with the Cold War. And I started off flying a, a autopilot training the F-102 uh, Delta uh, built by Convair, and uh, that was a precursor to learning how to fly the F-101B, which is a two-seat Voodoo stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. And our job there was to uh, go out into the ocean day or night. And, uh, and, and, uh, and this was uh, in 1966, uh, about a few years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the Russians were still flying down to Cuba. And uh, our job was to go out there and intercept these aircraft and, and then in part just to let them know we're there and to uh, and note anything that looked different and, uh, and pass that on. After about a year and a half of doing that, I got orders to Southeast Asia and uh, I got uh, shipped to an air base near Las Vegas called Nellis. And it is uh, a, a major uh, training installation. The Air Force Fire Weapons School is there, as well as a huge battery range to the north of the base. And um, I got uh, assigned to uh, this F-105. It was my third uh, Century Series aircraft, even though I was fairly, fairly young to the Air Force. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, I could fly a fighter, and there was no. But what I was learning to do was actually how to fight with the aircraft, and how to perform the missions that the F-105 was assigned to do, which is dive bombing. And um, about this time, uh, the, the Russians were involved with uh, providing uh, surface-to-air missiles to. Uh, the North Vietnamese and the U.S. fighter tactics changed. Uh, when I first went to, to Nellis, uh, I learned we did nothing but low-level flying. Uh, you know, as fast, you know, pretty fast. We we're well above 500 knots, uh, at maybe 500 feet, and uh, we we're learning how to identify. Uh, a particular point in the ground that we would use for a pop-up and then we would pop up to an altitude, dive bomb, and pull off and, and, uh, and head on our way home. That all changed. So <clears throat> about uh, two thirds of my way through my training and we shifted to flying basically what was called pod formations. 
uh, a a group of engineers at Wright Pad had developed an electronic pod that could be mounted on the outboard pylons of the F-105 that were jamming. And uh, if you were able to fly so that you were within a certain distance from each other and, and separated like this way in altitude as well, and you had four flights of four like this, that was the formation that we drove, and it was like going to B set going to Berlin in B 17s. It was I felt exact. I mean, my first missions into into the Route Pack Six up into the Hanoi area. Uh, that vision came back from to me from the watching these World War II movies. I'm boring in here like a B seventeen pilot. And uh, and so the, uh, I got assigned to Karat in uh, October 1967, and uh, these the next uh, several months were rather brutal. Uh, in the time frame that I was at uh, at Karat, uh, we lost uh, not quite, but close to 40 percent of the people uh, either killed in action or shot down and became prisoners of war or just flat missing. You never saw them. I had no idea where they went. And so in any event, uh, <clears throat> I started flying in October, and actually the first place I went on November 4th, 1967, was to a place called DNBM Fu, which is where the last battle that the French fought against the Viet Minh uh, and pulled out of France. The France pulled out of Southeast Asia as a result of the defeat they suffered at that site. Well, <clears throat> nonetheless, by the time I got there, we were, I got assigned to that target and I got shot at for my effort. And, uh, and, and so that was my, my, my first experience with uh, somebody on the ground not appreciating the fact that you're a runner around. Let me just take you. Let me take you right back to going from the F one hundred two to the F one hundred one to the F one hundred five, and and you said you knew how to flew. You knew you knew how to flew a fighter. So now it was a question of you learning the tactics. Um, what uh, what did you think about the F one hundred five then? I mean, so so the first thing is you you've gone into air defense command. So your job is to go and shoot potentially bad guys down. That's your job, right? In the F one hundred two and the F one hundred one, you're now going to go to a ground attack role in a in a very different airplane. What were your feelings about that role, and what did you think about the F-105 then as an aeroplane? The F-101 had a, a fairly high wing loading, and so did the F-105. And uh, in, in many ways, uh, going from the F-101 to the F-105 in terms of the aircraft itself was uh, it, it was no issue. I mean, it was the takeoff speed were were, were similar. Although the F-101 had much more powerful, so the takeoff distance was much shorter. Uh, and the F-101 would climb like a banshee. And uh, matter of fact, that night, if it was cold, your initial rate of climb is, I mean, I had 50 degrees of, of pitch up on the nose. And this, this thing had disappeared. I'd get up to uh, 35,000 feet in two minutes. Uh, not true with the F-105. <laughs> uh, they had a great big, beautiful J-75 engine in it and um, with water injection that would give you an additional 2,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, but it was a heavy airplane, and it was big. It was 13 feet from the cockpit to the ground. The, you know, and so it was a huge. And when the, a lot of the airplanes that I flew, you go around and you touch this and you look at that and you know, it's your pre-flight aircraft. The F-105, you spend your time kind of pretty much looking up at it. And uh, because it was it was it was so huge. Uh, and uh, uh, at, it took some time to uh, get to quote know the airplane, mm-hmm. to to uh, to un- understand its limitations in terms of uh, and, and understanding of, as you are pulling on a stick and pulling G's, what the airplane is telling you uh, the, the, through the buffet and the burble and how the stick is, feels in your hands and, uh, and so on. 
And uh, when I was saying that uh, went to my third century series fighter, I was becoming sensitive as I was going through these different airplanes of what this airplane is telling you as it's flying. You can demand things. And the airplane was going to turn around and tell you, ah, I ain't going to do that. And uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, that, that, that took some time. And, and uh, learning the uh, uh, how, how to roll in on a target and how to roll out on a target and how to judge your drifting rate and so on. Because we were all using manual bombs. Man, it's, what I was doing with the F-105 was the same thing that the guys in the P-47s were doing in World War II. We were just a little bit faster. And I had a jet as compared to great big prop. Uh, but the mission was uh, pretty much identical, using, in many cases, the same bombs. <laughs> mm. And so it took it took some understanding of, of that. Uh, the other uh, aspect that I uh, that I had to learn in the F-105 that was not taught, which kind of surprised me in the Air Defense Command, you'd think you'd be dogfighting in Air Defense Command. Uh-uh. We were out flying pretty much straight level and shooting missiles at bombers. Hmm. Uh, that was its mission, as compared to being able to maneuver the aircraft and take advantage of your position to take down another guy. And so uh, there, there was a lot of head work going on in my mind on, on what I was being asked to do in a fairly short period of time with that jet. And so a lot of learning going on. What was the advice then or, or the position on on doing that against migs when you got into theater were they saying to you at nellis it's okay to try and dogfight with this airplane or were they saying if you get into a position where you have to this is how you need to learn how to do it yeah that that was a learning process uh it it, it, it took time because the the classical method that was taught uh, for dogfighting um uh, Back at the at the back at the ranch, so to speak, was to be able to maneuver the aircraft into the six into the six o'clock position of the other aircraft. Big seventeen is going to turn circles on you, you know. So if you try to turn with this guy, you know you you can turn a little, but that's about it, and you're going to blow right past him. Uh, although I have to say that there were a number of people, uh, many of them I know that uh, got into uh, dogfights and were successful in shooting down uh, MiG-17s. Uh, I think there was 20, 29 and a half kills or something like that, if I remember right, yeah. in, the, in, in, in the history books of the F-105. So, so, so what were the F-105's strong points then? So no, it's not a turning fighter, and it doesn't have the power of something like the F-101. Where, where was it strong? It was a very stable aircraft. Uh, it was extraordinarily fast. If you look at the front end of this thing, it's... Uh, <coughs> There's not much wing area looking at you up, up, up right at the front, uh, so it was it was extremely fast. Uh, I have had this airplane um, well over 800 knots on the deck, and it would stay there, hmm. it, you know, and minimum even minimum afterburner, and this thing would really move. That was a terrific advantage. And after I learned, as I mentioned, how to fight with this airplane, I changed my dive bombing uh, pat patterns that I learned at Nellis uh, on what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do with the airplane at Karak was to uh, uh, get the airplane as steep as I could get it. We were taught 45 degrees. I liked to dive bomb at 60 degrees. And instead of dropping a bomb to 500 knots at 9,000 feet, I'd like to be at 600 knots. And the reason for that was the max limit on a MiG-21 was 595. And I wanted to be above his speed 
So as I came off the bottom of the target, I'm already accelerating out in front of him. If he happened to be there waiting for me to, you know, come in. So, so he had to come in at some, some angle that I could see. Him. And so uh, there, it was a very stable aircraft. Uh, it could carry an enormous load. And so even with the bombs on it, uh, if we got attacked uh, and there were, a, there were MiGs behind us, we could have very often uh, just drop the fuel tanks and outrun them to the target. Right. The F-4s were our fighter escorts, and they would be behind us. And when we got to a point where we're approaching the target area, the the force commander would say, "Okay, push it up," and uh, we and so we and they we're not an afterburner. We're just you know advancing the throttle to our uh, running speed, and the F fours behind us would be calling burners because they couldn't keep up with us. What was the uh, penalty then for doing that in terms of fuel consumption? I mean, did you also have long legs? Well, we had. Uh, uh, internal fuel. We had two fuel tanks, but we also had uh, in the well. The airplane was originally built as a nuclear strike aircraft, and there was a big uh, space that would have been occupied by a nuclear bomb that had a plunger on it, and they loaded a fuel tank on in there, three hundred ninety gallons, and uh, and so we had a fair amount of internal fuel, but. When we were uh, right after takeoff out of Karak, the first place we went were to refueling uh, orbit areas, and the tankers would meet us there. And uh, we would refuel on the way in, and then on the way out, we'd be looking for another tanker. <laughs> and we could refuel either with a basket or probe and drove, either way. And I've done them both. What just just stay, staying with what you were doing at Nellis for a moment, and then we can we can then get into your you know deployment out to um, to Thailand and and then your missions. But you talked about the change of tactics three quarters of the way through your training program from low level to this pod formation. What specifically was that pod formation doing then? So the SA two was the threat that it was designed to counter. Were you just flipping a switch in the cockpit? And then the electronics do the rest, or were you having to manage the systems in the airplane as a as a formation? It was all automated. Yeah, you, know, you turn you, you turn the pot on, and uh, and the system took over from there. And uh, the idea was there were uh, the idea was uh, for the uh, uh, SA two. The operators had two scopes. They had an elevation scope, and they had a azimuth scope. And if you flew this formation right, the idea was that you they wouldn't see you. They, all they would see would be jamming in all the directions. And if you got yourself too far out, you'd identify yourself. Hmm. And, and, and you know, my understanding is that the, as the war progressed, uh, the, the the Russians didn't stop their technology. They kept improving. And um, and, and uh, they were able to spot us anyway, and so I wound up learning how to outfight many Sams. We'll get we'll get to that. That sounds cool. So, so just before we talk about then the the, the, the final deployment, then when, when you were at Nellis, were you just doing some kind of abbreviated checkout to get you ready to go and drop iron bombs over Vietnam, or were you doing the full syllabus, including the nuke stuff? What uh, what was the course? Yeah, there were two courses, and I took the long course, the full course. Uh, there were other people that had been current in the F-105 at different bases, maybe went off to a staff job and were being put back into the aircraft to go off to fly combat. Um, and they went through a considerably shortened syllabus, uh, training syllabus, than I did. But I, I went through the whole thing. I got, uh, I think my training was from... Uh, from May until September, and I could go in uh, my logbook, my trusty logbook here, and, and see how many training stories I had. But it was it was a, a fair number. What was, was this at the time, Denny? When 
uh, I think it, maybe it was before the time when pilot shortages were occurring and they were bringing guys from C-130s and uh, C-119s and stuff. They were moving people from airlift command into, into fighters to try and fill the gap. Um, was that happening around then or did that happen later? You mean in terms of the people that were being brought into the F-105? Yeah, because they were, they were getting guys from heavies and moving them into fighters, weren't they, to make up for the fact that you know, the yeah, they began. Uh, that began, I think, probably just uh, a little bit before my time, okay. because uh, the, you know, prior the, the the people that were generally being brought into the F one hundred five initially uh, were guys that had already been flying the F one hundred and were familiar with. Uh, low-level tactics and dive bombing, strafing, shooting rockets, and so and so on. But there's only so many 100 pilots, and they were pretty heavily involved in South Vietnam. So they they, they couldn't rob Peter to pay Paul, uh, you know, and, and continue. And so eventually got to the point where they were bringing guys like myself from Air Defense Command into this new mission, but they were also bringing in people that were flying 141s, B-52 pilots, you know, anybody that flew. And they were running through the course syllabus. Uh, not everybody graduated. There were some that uh, just couldn't couldn't do it. And uh, and others uh, got there and they said, ma, they say for me, I quit. And uh, But that, those were very few. But it, it did happen. Uh, so we, well, by the time I, in my class, uh, I had, uh, in, in my F-105 class, we had uh, uh, two F-100 pilots, three F-100 pilots, and, um, and then uh, some of us from Air Defense Command, some from, that were instructor pilots in Air Training Command. And, uh, you know, so, so they're beginning to draw, draw in from uh, the pilot base as compared to the fighter force. What were your emotions about going out to um, the Vietnam War? I, I don't mean so much in, in, in so far as um, going to war, but actually that particular mission in that particular aeroplane um, and and understanding that it was you know one of the most uh, risky things that you could be doing as, as a fighter pilot. There were you know, everybody who went out there and flew was at risk, but, you know, thud losses are infamous for, for being high. Um, and you've already referenced the fact that sort of 40% or so of your uh, comrades were lost while you were there. Did you have any anticipation uh, prior to arriving that that's how it was going to be? How did you feel about it? Well, actually, it never really... Uh, I, got, I got an assignment to, to fly this aircraft and... and, uh, and, and I was happy to do it. Uh, I, uh, that's what I was trained for. I mean, that's why I went through power training. And uh, I, I don't remember you know, any of the guys, uh, that, any of the squatters that I was involved in, uh, grumbling very much about, uh, oh, this war is terrible and all that stuff. Because, you know, if your attitude is like that, you're not going to last very long. Uh, because you don't mentally prepare yourself for about what you're ready to do. And you place yourself in great vulnerability, uh, in, you know, in terms of uh, being able to respond to what you're about to face. It can't, uh, when you're being shot at, there's no time to be, start getting nervous. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have some ice in those veins. Uh, to be able to just stay there as she goes. But after the mission is over, you can go to the club and you can relieve some stress. <laughs> and that was done. Matter of fact, there were uh, stories in the F-105 in the ejection seat right back here it was a place about that long and about that big around where you could slip in a thermos bottle. And it was built for long range missions with this nuclear mission in mind. And you had this little hose that could come out and put it in your mouth underneath your oxygen mask and uh, take a sip of water. 
And uh, it's been told that uh, many guys had gin and tonics in there. <laughs> Take the edge off. <laughs> <clears throat> you you said before we before we hit record we were just having a chat just generally but you said you were 26 when you you went into combat um up until that point um had you really thought about the dangers of the job that you were doing i mean were, were you just a 26 year old um you know hard charging hard drinking bloke who was just enjoying life um did you ever reflect on what you were doing and the fact tomorrow you might not be here I mean, in terms of, you know, we focused on, uh, on the targets themselves. You know, how do you attack an airfield? How do you attack a bridge? What tactics do you use? What weapons should you be using? What's the best way to deploy that weapon? You had plenty to be thinking about and, uh, uh, without getting your, your head all wrapped around uh, some, you know, political issues. So to speak, or any of that stuff. I mean, that, I don't remember any conversations on that. We, uh, except for the guys, were uh, pretty frustrated that uh, they wouldn't let us loose. We we had a lot of constraints around us. When I first got to Karat, uh, there was uh, large rings around Hanoi. It was a no fly zone. There were bands of 20 miles or more between the Chinese border and North Vietnam that was a no-fly zone so that they didn't aggravate the Chinese or any of that stuff. And and <clears throat> we were not allowed to uh, attack initially, allowed to attack airfields, uh, initially could not attack surface-to-air missile sites, even though you could be sitting there looking at them, watching them building these things, uh, unless the the White House permitted you to attack it. And, uh, and, and uh, LBJ has been quoted as saying, these guys can't hit an outhouse without my permission. And, uh, and, and, and that was an extraordinarily frustrating event for us because we knew that uh, there were better ways to fight this war. That part we did talk about. Um, and, and it's been written about extensively since uh, by guys that flew F-105s that uh, retired as Air Force four stars. And, uh, and, and they, they, they talked about that quite a bit. A guy named uh, Piotrowski is one. Uh, big, you know, there's many others. Hmm. Talk, talking then about sort of age and the, the time in, in so far as it being not that long after the Second World War, and you've just referenced P-47s and tactics and the mission being largely similar, just the platform's different. Were there, were there people in your squadron who had flown in the Second World War? What, what was your leadership like? I'm sorry, the people who had flown? Who had flown in World War II? Were there, were there any? Oh, yeah, 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 there sure were. Uh, or uh, not only World War II, but also in Korea. And uh, because you know a lot of people, you know, that's kind of a forgotten war. But there was there there were a lot of people that uh, fought in all three uh, three wars. Um, did they have to, so? Of, did they have words, the guys, words of advice for you? Was there you know being surrounded by that or having those people to look up to? Did that make a difference in terms of your mental preparedness um, to go and do the mission? There, there wasn't a lot of most of that kind of took place uh, uh, at the bar. Uh, that that was where you learned a lot. Of, uh, you, you can only learn so much by uh, uh, studying books and, and and trying to imagine. But uh, it was it was at the bar that the. Uh, a lot of the real conversations were taking place of uh, and the many of the tactics that were used uh, during World War II, uh, and especially with uh, air to air fighting, we learned that that didn't apply. I mean, it was a different attack, you know, a, a, it was a different battle. And, and same for the, uh, the those aircraft that were in, uh, in Korea. 
uh, the big MiG-15 was a huge surprise. Uh, the, uh, the Air Force wound up having had to accelerate uh, uh, fielding the F-86 to be able to uh, combat the F-15. And uh, that's that's a whole other story. But in any event, uh, the, uh, the, the leadership that we had uh, I'd gone through the ranks and most, most of the leaders that we had that were filling the, the senior positions had had combat experience uh, in an earlier war. Uh, one of the most famous one was an F-4 guy named Robert Olds. And, uh, and you know, General Olds, he, I mean, he, he, was a, he was a hardened, wizened uh, fighter pilot who, uh, you know, the old story used to be your the mission is to fly and fight and don't ever forget it. And uh and, and, and you know, don't forget what your purpose is. This is what this is what we do. We smack we blow up stuff. <laughs> so, so tell us about that, that blowing stuff up then. I mean you, you referenced I, I stopped you because you were galloping away, but I you, you were talking about that first mission and, and being shot at. Um, so did you always then go and fly this pod formation? Did you ever revert back to a low-level ingress and a pop-up uh, and, a, and a dive attack? Uh, no, uh, we never did. But we, no, I, we got down low, uh, the, but uh, the, the mission it was in a different area. It was not up at Route Pack 6. Uh, often down in the uh, area just north of the defense, uh, demilitarized zone, the DMZ, and uh, Route Pack 1, we'd be down, you know, fair, fairly low uh, road breaking, looking for targets, uh, lo- looking for truck parks, uh, because uh, North Vietnamese were really good at camouflage and, uh, and, and hit their vehicles very well. And, uh, but people that knew how to read the forest could spot these signature points to say, there's one right there. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, these were very often forward air controllers that were flying uh, slow propeller aircraft. They, they would fire a rocket to mark a point. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the guys in my pilot training class wound up doing that, flying in North Vietnam in an old one. What was yeah. the what, what were the challenges around that mission then? Were you um, so if you've got an old you've got an illuminated site that you can dial the milliradians into. You've got an airspeed and an altitude you want to drop at relative to the ground. So was was the challenge just being able to fly precisely? Um, what what was difficult about it? Well, the, the obvious aim is to be able to uh, find and destroy a target. And uh, uh, you, that, 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 that was the challenge. Um, the effects of wind and uh, the, the clouds used often weather uh, impacted you quite a bit, uh, and and so we we work try to work our way around through all those. Did, did, did some of that become instinctive? Then you you mentioned earlier about being able to judge your drift, um, that being one of the challenges of being able to put a, an iron bomb, an unguided bomb, on target. Uh, did did that stuff become instinctive the more you did it, or was it always something that you had to concentrate very hard to get right? Initially, uh, concentrated very very hard. After a while, uh, you know, being able to it's in many ways uh, dive bombing is not that much different from golf. Uh, it sounds similar, but you you uh, you develop this uh, sight pattern. And you repeated it time after time. You know, just you know, very simple, the same rolling, same pull rate. It's just like the you know, keeping your arm locked and the same swing to, to be able to drive the ball. And uh, and, and so in that sense, uh, after a while, uh, the, you're still concentrating on a target, but you're able to read the drift rate of how the wind is attacking you. Uh, whether or not you're a little bit too steep from where you wanted to be, and so your your bomb reticle, we call it a pipper uh, setting, wouldn't be 
exactly where it should be. So you have to adjust for that mentally. And, uh, or your airspeed is off. You're a little bit too slow. You're a little bit too fast. And, uh, and so you made all these uh, adjustments. The other, to compensate for that, we almost always drop, we had six bombs typically. Uh, unless there was a no bomb shortage and you only had four, you know, or two. <laughs> and, uh, but there was an intervalometer that, uh, uh, have dropped these bombs individually. They didn't all fall off at the same time. They came off this one, this one, this one, this one, that one. And and, and they would, uh, you could adjust the time in be between what the bomb, uh, when the bombs come off. And when you dropped it, that would be called, we call that a stick. And it would have a certain width of the bomb craters, you know, the, 750 pound bomb, you're building a 30 foot swimming pool. And, and depending upon your dive angle, you could, uh, you, you could drop that stick so that if you're going to do a road cut, you wouldn't go right down the road. You'd come at it at an angle and, and same with the bridge so that you're, one of those bombs is going to hit it. And, uh, and, and so that was, that was the, the aim of the exercise. Airfield different story because you get a fairly good sized runway and it's fairly long. And so you know, depending upon what was happening in the area in terms of the defense, you start looking at where their their AAA sites were located, where the uh, surface air missile sites were located. And uh, from that, you adjusted your, your attack heading. Uh, and also the time of day, you know, taking advantage of the sun if you could, and uh, if, if that made any difference. Uh, but a lot of that stuff we didn't have much control over because a lot of that was generated out of the Pentagon from the White House. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that you had you prefer to dive bomb at sixty degrees angle. Oh yes, and, yes, yeah. And you prefer to be at six hundred knots at the bottom of that rather than slower yes. and, and shallower. Um, how much closer did that bring you to the ground? Um, did that expose you to more risk of AAA or actually just hitting the ground? Um, what, what sort of did it shorten your reaction times for pulling out? Um, what were the compromises on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, if you drop if you drop the bombs at the forty five degree angle at uh, five hundred fifty knots, we were dropping them at nine thousand feet or 9,500 feet. And we try to pull off over the ground around 5,500 feet. And the idea of being at that altitude, uh, you're above most of the small arms fire. Hmm. And uh, as we came off the target, we would be maneuvering the aircraft in unpredictable fashions, up and down uh, to spoil anybody's aim. At 60 degrees and at 600 knots, as soon as the bombs came off, I banged the airplane right back in the afterburner. And the reason I did that uh, was to maintain the energy as the aircraft was coming out of the bottom of the guy. And uh, so I made full use of the, all the Gs available to me to be able to get that airplane on the ground. And um, I suspect I probably was a little lower uh, for a very short period of time, but I was a whole lot faster and I went up pretty quick, you know, but not that far up, you know, just in a, just so I was above that, that predictable uh, uh, ground fire region. Uh, one of the guns that uh, typically the AAA, would have, they had 100 millimeter, uh, 80, 57, but they also had 37 millimeter mounted, quad mounted uh, rapid fire machine guns. And you, you kind of wanted to stay away from those guys because uh, they could pour out a lot of ammunition in a hurry. Was there any um, consideration given then to, to, to leaving, to egressing the target as a formation, or was it everybody? just run out as quickly as they can, and then you rejoin to, to go to the tanker at some point? You joined up with somebody. Uh, and so it might not be, you tried to join up with your own uh, people in your flight, 
But that didn't always occur. But you always joined up with somebody, but you got line of breast as compared to being, you know, in a formation, your line of breast. And what you're doing is looking toward the rear of that other aircraft and uh, seeing if there's fire, you know, triple uh, A coming after them or mixed. And because uh, we were constantly maneuvering, both of you, and uh, all, the, all the way in and all the way, well, not all the way in, you're boring your way in, but you're maneuvering at a much faster rate of airspeed on the way out. We talked before we hit record about a mutual friend of ours, a good friend of yours, but Earl, Earl Henderson. And I, I listened to one of his tapes um, and I uh, listened to an interview with his son, Neil, uh, that he had done separately. Uh, but on the tape, you can you can hear the, f the they're obviously in pop formation and the commander is saying there's a Sam coming up and, he, and he's saying, hold it steady, boys. It's not guiding on us. And then in the interview with Neil, um, he says, well, it's all very well. The force commander <laughs> saying, hold it steady, boys. It's not guiding on us. But if I see it, and it I think it's guiding on me, then I'm, I'm going to maneuver. Um, what was the what was the process then for maintaining that pop formation when you were actually being shot at? How much discretion did you have to maneuver if you felt you needed to? If you got shot at by Sam, uh, you pretty much had to take care of business right there and forget the formation. And uh, the first thing that I did was, because uh, this this thing is going Mach 2, and it's basically small wings. And uh, and as soon as the, the booster comes off, uh, the Sam is able to receive a command and control signal from the ground unit. And... Uh, and so I watched this thing up, and you could see these things launch because of the huge cloud dust underneath uh, the, you know, as, as this thing roared off the launch pad. And you began watching it, and uh, if it stayed steady in the canopy, it's pretty much coming right at you. And, uh, and so I would lower the nose, advance the throttle to get a little bit faster airspeed, and if this thing started rising on the canopy, they ain't after me. It's locked on to somebody else. If it starts coming down, now it starts getting interesting. It's still, you know, and so now I poke the nose down a little bit farther, bang in the afterburner to, to get maintain my, my energy because I'm going to need it here pretty quick. And, uh, and, and get this missile's nose buried as deep as I can while watching it coming towards you. And this is the hard part knowing where this thing is and pulling up. If you pull up too late, it's going to hit you. If you pull up too early, it'll follow you. So you had to time it just right. And there's only one time to learn that. And then for after that, you repeat the exercise. And, <laughs> and uh, if the missile uh, was actually on you and you pulled up at the right time, the missile would slide down and underneath you and, and it didn't, you know, go off over there if, if it all worked out well. And I had, to, I, I probably all thought, I don't know, maybe 30 uh, in, in, in the sorties that I flew up in the Route Pack 6. Uh, there were times where, you know, the, the, the danger was uh, because they began firing these uh, in salvo. So it, it might not be just one miss, missile after you, it might be two. And so you got to see them both. And if one is coming this way and the other one is over here, you're in a pack of trouble. Uh, you're you're looking for you know you're looking at two different directions at the same time, and uh, and, and and your work was really cut off for you. As soon as you pull a nose up and this thing slides underneath you, you've already got the airplane at afterburner and you're climbing back up into position to be rejoined into your flight. But they did not move. They stayed right there because, if, you know, they, they were not under attack. You were. So you had to take, you had to take care of business yourself. When the first time you ever got realized then that, that a missile was guiding on you, what, how did you feel? Did you, did, were you scared? You don't have time to be scared. You're busy as can be because what you're doing is you're, you're trying to anticipate what, when this, uh, uh, missile is is coming down and I realize that it's it's nose is now fairly deep and uh and, and if you pull up now 
it does, it's not going to have a chance. And so you, you're basically out, you're dog fighting with a missile. And, and, and when you're in a fight, that's no time to start getting nervous. How many seconds typically was it between you seeing it and it, you having to, to, to maneuver to, to make it slide behind you? The seconds fly by fast. I, I, maybe 15, okay. 20. And what do you what what do you actually see? Is it a little speck? I mean, so you've said you see it. There's there's a cloud of dust as it lifts off. But once the boost is off, what do you see? Is it a tiny speck? And if you take your eyes off of it, you're going to lose it. It's like looking at the pointy end of a pencil, and uh, it's a you know fair. But we were you, we were used to looking for small things. Yeah, we're looking for you know little tiny dots that are moving off. You know, those are airplanes, you know, so, but you're right. Uh, I didn't take my eyes off that thing. You said that obviously you do a lot of learning in the bar and you've said that the first time you learn how to dodge one of these things, it's, it's for real. Had, had you seen other airplanes do that? Did you have some idea from bar conversations what you needed to do? How did you really know how to react? Through bar conversations and talking to people that have successfully did it, and, and uh, there were there were briefing and some training sessions, but generally speaking, it was it, it was other fighter pilots that had you know done it before, and uh, and, and and you know they they taught us. Did did the SAM operators have um, particular tactics? And you've just said that you could get two two coming at you from different directions. Was that a something they were able to pull off regularly? Was that a, a bit of a you know they had to be having a really good day to try and make that happen? What sort of tactics did they use? Well, part of, part of it was that their their tactics were changing as well. Uh, and not you know there there was the more nothing is static. Uh, uh, what you did today is maybe very different than what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Might be the same, but uh, but chances are that you know that everybody on both sides are worrying and uh, and, and, and making changes. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> and and their capability uh, changed. To, you know, at the point where if they could spot you um, and, and the, you know you. They, they could they could shoot at you. Hmm. Um, one of the things that was uh, uh, normally the case, uh, if you were being shot at by Sam's, you didn't have to worry about mix because they're outside of that. They, they don't want to be anywhere near that. I happen to be going in, uh, coming off the water route and going up the Black River, uh, Red River, and uh, uh, this is uh, in December. 1967, mm -hmm. we've just finished coming off the water route uh, refueling tanker and we're heading up in, we're into our pod formations and, and heading towards Hanoi. And uh, I spotted this flight of four, uh, make 15 or 17s below us. And I call that out in the air and uh, the MIGs were just joining up. They, were, they had two, two ships. They are just joining up. And uh, just as that, uh, they were joining up, the lead, MIG lead, 17 lead, got hit by a surface to air missile that still had the booster on it. They hadn't been guided yet. And so he got hit by this flying telephone pole as it blew up. And the wingman just, they just broke out, and we never saw them again. <laughs> they, were, they, they left. What are the chances? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so did you have um, uh, radar warning e equipment on the airplane? Could you tell that way if someone was targeting you? Yes. Uh, we had raw gear. Uh, it was a, a little round scope along with the gear, and... Uh, uh, it had a volume control on there, and you, it had these different rings. And so, depending upon what was looking at you, so it happened to be long, long range radar, uh, it, you would hear a certain tone. If it happened to be a surface to air sight, uh, you'd hear a different tone. And if, uh, if the booster was off, you'd hear a different tone again. Uh, 
Uh, you know, and, and I think that that uh, if, if there's one a few SAM sites around uh, that probably was useful. I turned it down. I turned the volume off, and I didn't pay any attention to it because I wanted to see what was going on around around me, not staring at this thing. Uh, and so I paid no attention to it. But yes, we had. It. Hmm. I think the weasels. Uh, made much more use of that uh, than uh, than I did as the, the strike pilot. And I, even when I was flying as a wing, and I, I flew six sorties and uh, out of my hundred as a, a wild weasel on a wing, and I had uh, five of my sorties were group pack six, where uh, I was asked to fire a, a, a strike missile, AGM forty five. Or and and or uh, dive bomb the target because like one case I dived on the SAM site carrying six seven or fifty pound bombs, and another time the uh, SAM site uh, the dive they said go bomb that and so I did I had five hundred pound bombs on that one, and but that's, on that same mission I also fired uh, AGM forty five, and uh, the way that happened is that the the weasel would spot these targets coming up and he would pull the nose up and I'd go up with him and the back seat or the bear would say okay ready ready fire and I'd shoot that missile off and out so I was just a hired gun and uh, <laughs> and, and uh, that's our, that was standard practice at uh, Karat. Uh, at Takli different story. Uh, the Takli we had uh, at Karat we had uh, F, two F models that were the wild weasels and then two uh, strike pilots flying wings uh, and we would be our mission was to fly with the weasels first in last out and, uh, and and so I had my time doing barrel rolls over Hanoi chasing Mike Muscat you know which <laughs> fairly famous uh, F-105 weasel very recognizable voice on the air just before we, we well we one thing we have got to do is talk about the root pack system and counters and, and the hundred mission um target, if you will. Um but before we do that, uh, can can we just talk a little bit about the triple A side of things? So so is it correct, is my understanding correct then that one of the things that they were trying to do was use the SAMs to drive you down into the range of the, the engagement uh, range of the triple A. And did you were you more concerned with SAMs or were you more concerned with AAA? Uh, we lost probably 80% of our uh, aircraft to AAA. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, they had some very big guns. Uh, and if we were going in, the, typically the highest pod aircraft in a pod formation would be up around 19,000 feet. AAA the, the, the 80, 80 and 100 millimeters, they go way up higher than you. And, but they would set these things off so that they would start uh, 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 going off at, at your altitude. And, uh, and so in some cases, the force commander would be adjust his wing pattern based on what he could see the AAA was doing. And uh, but very often, if you, if you try to outmaneuver uh, of uh, firing AAA, unless they were actually tracking you specifically, uh, you're just as liable to weave into a burst as to weave out of it. You know, so, because when you're driving along and you look at the ground and you can see these sites and they're, they're, they're lined up, these six uh, guns are all in a circle and they would go off clockwise. And so you see the muzzle flashes and you count six seconds and you could see where that went off. And you could tell what kind of gun it was based on the color of the flak itself. Mm. You know, so white was 57, uh, black was uh, 80 and 100 millimeter. And, uh, you know, so you, you see these puffs going off. 57s uh, were, were able to get up to you uh, but uh, there are more of a, a lower level uh, threat than, than high level. And so as we started going into the target area, we were at the, around, you know, 16, 17,000 feet. 
you know, so the small arms fire is, is no threat. As you're approaching the target area, the first thing you're going to hear are mix. Hmm. And uh, there were times, though, that uh, I'm going into the Hanoi area, there were not, there was no AAA, no mix, no SAMs. I think they happen once. <laughs> uh, it was completely undercast, uh, went in as a weasel on, on that particular mission. And uh, we came back home, and in uh, one kind, one cut case, we actually came back home with the weapons. We didn't drop them. And, and flying should, over an undercast was, was a da- particularly dangerous thing to do, right? Because the, oh, you ain't kidding, because you can't see what, what's coming up through it. Uh, that, that, that matter of fact, uh, that was a lesson learned. Uh, we had the, uh, this radar bombing called MSQ sites where the, a ground controller could steer you to a particular heading and then he would uh, tell you when to drop the bombs and all, the whole force would drop their bombs all at that same time. At MSQ. Well, they started doing that, sending us into North Vietnam uh, up around in, in Route Pack 6, being driven by these MSQ sites. And, uh, and uh, at one point, uh, you know, started losing airplanes left and right. And they said, this is a dumb idea. And so um, it, that, that behavior stopped. You know, Wayne Commander said, I ain't doing that. Sorry. Did, did you have a, a particular plan in mind if you were going, if you were shot down? Um, uh, you know, some people talk about saving, you know, sh- having a shootout and then saving the last bullet for themselves. Did you f- did you have much information about what was happening to your um, fellow pilots and, and air crew who had been shot down, whether or not they were being housed in in a, in a prisoner of war camp, whether or not they were being executed? Did, what, what was your plan if you if you were going to have to eject over? I, 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 actually, I, I actually personally never had one. I, you know, if I, if I got hit, my aim was to get that airplane as far away from the target area as I could and as close to home as I could in hopes of being able to bail out into an area where uh, I, I could be picked up. Uh, but, but I had never, I, I had actually I had not developed a uh, plan of, uh, of what I was going to do myself. Uh, I, I carried a pistol. Uh, uh, the, from what I've read, probably the best thing you could do with that is throw it away. Mm-hmm. That'd be handy. Uh, I, I thought of, that pistol might be handy if I got shot down somewhere. And if, if, if I needed, I could use it for, uh, but you hate to make your presence known uh, to uh, get lunch. <laughs> Speak, speaking of being hit, the F-105 infamously had this issue with the hydraulics going and the horizontal tails um, deflecting to full leading edge up, I think it was, wasn't it? So the aeroplane would nose dive towards the ground. Um, was was that uh, a concern? Was that something, again, that you spent any time thinking about how you would respond to if it occurred to you? Was it realistic that, that you would be able to do anything about it if it did happen? Um, and were, were there any efforts to fix that? Yes, there were. Uh, one of the things they did was reroute the hydraulic lines to, to above the engine, uh, and back to the. But you're right. If you got hit in the tail, you could have uh, you could lose your hydraulic fluid that would operate the the, the tail, tail surface, and uh, they developed a slab lock system so that if your airspeed was, if you were able to have the air nose above the horizon at a certain airspeed, you could flip that switch, if you're losing your hydraulic pressure, flip that switch and you'd actually lock the slab. And uh, and, and I, I know guys, I've heard of guys that have flown the aircraft. And the other thing that they added uh, as time goes by, uh, they, they added a, 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 the electric motors for the flaps uh, could be used to, to uh, if you lost your hydraulic pressure, which you know that operated the spoilers and the ailerons, but the, the flaps were electrically driven, and so you could uh, maneuver yourself if you had your slab lock, and you could maneuver yourself with the, with these flaps, and hopefully keep the airspeed out so that you could get yourself out over the water or over the jungle someplace and jump out this thing when the engine quit. There were changes that were were coming in. 
Matter of fact, uh, one of the things that they changed, uh, or oh, it almost finished uh, my tour, uh, but at this, uh, the, most of the sorties that I flew uh, in, into uh, Hanoi area, uh, probably one of the more dangerous portions of the mission is on takeoff. And uh, if you, if we had a problem with the with the aircraft, and we were in, you know, short on a runway, if you were, we had to be over 120 knots uh, to be able to eject safely on the aircraft. We could do it at ground level, but you got to, you had to have 120 knots. And they developed a zero zero capability seat for, and so the aircraft were being modified with zero zero seats. So you could be sitting on the ground eject and you could be, you hopefully survive. So, so what was the um, administration? You've talked about route packs. Um, how was the airspace or the, I don't know if it was the airspace that was the route pack or if it was the bit on the ground that was the route pack, but how was how were things administered um, in terms of the way you flew your missions? There were uh, six route packs. And uh, it was divided up between the Air Force and the Navy. And the Air Force had, uh, it started off uh, with Route Pack 1 right above the demilitarized zone. And, uh, and, uh, and that went up into, uh, had into North Vietnam a fair distance ways. And then there was Route Pack 2 and then Route Pack 3. Those were, uh, those are generally speaking, Navy targeted areas. And we did that intentionally to deconflict the airspace so that they didn't have uh, a whole bunch of aircraft milling around in the same area, you know, trying to keep, you know, keep people separated. And uh, Route Pack, uh, route pack uh, 4 and 5 uh, were over on the upper left-hand side of, of uh, the, the airport. One, two, three, four, then five on the uh, north uh, and the west side of uh, North Vietnam. And then just a little bit west of Hanoi, there was a line that went right straight north and south, right down to the border and then straight east. And a, a line that went to, at a uh, 45 degree angle off. And so there was Route Pack 6 Alpha and Route Pack 6 Bravo. 6 Bravo were Navy targets up around Haiphong in that area. We penetrated the airspace, but we weren't generally targeted into, uh, into their airspace. We tra had to traverse it uh, both in and out, but uh, that's how it was done. I got a map around here somewhere that shows that off. And what about then the the concept of counters and then the one hundred mission target, if you will? Uh, how did that work? Initially, the thought was uh, uh, keep the guys over there for a year, and uh, and <clears throat> as experience would show, uh, very early on, early on in the war. Uh, the wing commanders were realizing that if we keep these people for a year, there ain't anybody going to go home. Hmm. They're, they're going to die. And so they came up with a, 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 this, okay, so you got to have 100 counters. Well, 100 counters are a mission into North Vietnam. Nine counters would have been a mission into the Steel Tiger, uh, which Laos, or uh, into South Vietnam. Those those would be, you'd fly the sortie, it'd be a combat mission, but it wouldn't be a counter. You know, so I had I had nine missions that were uh, generally in around Tet 68 into South Vietnam that were non-counters. And I came as close to dying there as I did anywhere else. Uh, we're testing a new gun sight system on the F-105. And uh, there was a clue by the very brilliant aeronautical engineer, fighter pilot, test pilots at Nellis, uh, or at Luke, at, Luke, at, uh, at Karat. And, uh, and these guys said, you know, we've got a lot of computers in this F-105. 
And the F4 has a system in there where if they roll in on a target and they designate the target with the pickle button, the, when you press that button, all you're doing is telling the system, okay, that's where the target is. And then when you pull back, if you pull back, the airplane decides when it's going to drop the bombs, not you. And then the bombs go off and strike into the target area. They said, well, we can build one of those. So I turned out to be a, a test pilot on one of these systems in, into South Vietnam, uh, not that far from Hue. Pretty hilly country around there. And a, a lot of smoke, debris all over the place. And I went absorption down my dive bomb attack. And they said, well, the site is supposed to come up into view. And then when this analog bar gets down to the six o'clock position, you can depress the pickle button. And when you pull back, the, the bombs will come off. The site never came up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going down lower and I said, oh, I'm going past my altitude. I'm still way past the start pulling it off. And the trees went like this. <laughs> but, oh, that's probably as in the air as frightened as I ever was. And it, it had nobody, well, I'm sure they were shooting at me, but uh, that isn't what scared me. It was I almost hit the trees. <laughs> did, did you have a, um, uh, a hat? I know that some squadrons had a hat. They would uh, etch the, the number of counters in, and then by the time they got to 100, it would be all the way around the rim. Was that a, a tradition of yours? Did you grow a moustache? How did, how did you yeah, guys... I, I, yeah, my roommate grew a mustache. I never did, and um, and some of the the mustaches were you know beautiful handlebars, and, and some of them got uh, yeah, pretty you know pretty fancy. I never did. Uh, I have a hat that's uh, and uh, we would mark the uh, regular uh, bomb drops uh, in, with a with a blue hash mark with five at a time. You know, four plus a cross mark. And uh, the, the uh, ones in the pack six are marked in red. And so I got 20 reds out of, out of my 100. And I, I wrote uh, the non-counters. Uh, I put those on a, on a different part of my hat. But yes, I have the hat. You still have it? I still have it, yeah. What then um, was the you know, sort of prevailing mood in the squadron. I mean, you talked about losses. You you seem to be very stoic about, you know, that side of things, that that's just, you know, that was a fact of life. You didn't want to dwell on it. Um, I, I read, I, I mean, I read Ed Rasmus's books about his time uh, flying the F-105. I read uh, Broughton's books and, and, uh, and various other publications. And it sounds like some people did throw their wings in. They did say they didn't want to fly anymore. Um, others got on with it. But what, what was the prevailing mood then in the squadron as as you went through your 100 mission tour? The prevailing mood was this: give me as many counters as you can give me. I want to get the heck out of here, you know. And uh, we had one fellow that uh, uh, said that I want I don't want to go anymore, and so they gave him a ground job. The rest of us, okay, that's your choice. We had no umbrage with him. We didn't, we, it didn't change our feeling about this fella at all. He happened to be in my fire squatter and I'd flown with him several times. And, uh, but he got to the point where he said, I've, you know, we've been losing so many people. He says, I, I, I gotta get home. And, uh, and so uh, it's okay. Uh, but for, the, for the, the prevailing mood was, I got 57, I need 58. I got 58. I need 59. You know, and he just kept pushing. And so we called up. And when he got up to 90, you were golden. Hmm. And the idea was that if you got over 90 and uh, these high, you know, high intensity targets came up, they gave you one of the lower intensity target areas to be able to go fly. That didn't always happen. There were people that, uh, uh, that had one, uh, Caleb Britt, uh, who happened to be a B-52 pilot, uh, one uh, that, that won the Air Force Cross, did an extraordinarily competent F-105 pilot, 
was on this, I think his 99th mission, and they had attacked a target in Hanoi. And um, I, I think, it, and, um, and the General Momeyer, who is the general officer in Saigon, asked him if he would be, who would come down to land in, in uh, Tansanu to Saigon to, uh, so he could congratulate him. And, um, and so Britt, Akila Britt uh, did that. And unfortunately, he got down there. There was a horrific rainstorm occurring on the airfield at the time. And they, uh, a C-123, uh, I think it was a C-123 aircraft, uh, got onto the runway. There's a miscommunication between the tower and the final approach. And Akila Bridge was on final approach out of fuel. He had already done a goal wrong to come back and, and, and land again. And, and this see, this aircraft was on the runway in front of this big prop driven aircraft. And Akilah Britt landed in this rainstorm and ran into the prop of, of, of this uh, aircraft and it killed him. And, um, and so his aircraft was off the side of the runway over there at Tonsonu upside down and it gets burnt. You know, so, but that, generally speaking, if you get 100 or 90, you were, you know, they were, they were trying to slow it down. For me, it didn't matter at that point because uh, President uh, Johnson had shut off the ability to go north of the 20th parallel. And, um, and, and uh, in, in many ways, for me personally, you know, I probably survived the war in part because I wasn't going downtown every day again. You know, where there was a period there where I was, I was, I was heading to Hanoi pretty, pretty frequently. And, uh, and, and, and some of those sort of things get pretty intense. And so when I got to the point of uh, having a hundred, we were already going mostly into uh, Route Pack 1. I had one weasel mission into Route Pack 1 uh, as a wingman of a blue weasel. And we were out there at that time, this was in April uh, 1916, looking for SAM sites. Because once the war up north got shut off, the North Vietnamese, they ain't so dumb. They started moving all this stuff down south. And uh, and, and so uh, the, the war down south, the, the portions of the North Vietnam, that changed. Are there, well, there must be, but what, what missions in particular stick in your mind from from your tour well uh, there were there's there are several of them but they all relate to uh, uh targets uh, you know, i i've attacked a domer bridge twice and, i was gonna ask you I, I've, I've attacked the hanoi rail classification yard which is just across the domer bridge uh they go across another river and there's a hanoi Real classification yard. Then there's another bridge on top of that, and uh, that, that, that other bridge is called the Canal de Rapids, and I've attacked that, as well as the Domer Bridge, and as well as the rail yard. So we cut off the Domer Bridge, cut off the Canal de Rapids. The aircraft, the the, the railroad cars were stuck uh, in that real classification yard, and then we went after that and, and obliterated the yard. Uh, it's uh, those are very memorable stories. Uh, another one that is uh, memorable was uh, there's an airfield up a uh, 45 degree angle uh, from Hanoi heading to the northeast, about halfway up, called KEP, K E P. And the 921st uh, Fighter Regiment for the North Vietnamese uh, uh, flew MiG 17s out of there. And, uh, and, you know, different part of my writings of I've, I've tried to capture uh, who the MiG pilot was of the guys that shut down people out of my fighter squadron. And, uh, and and I know uh, for a fact that one of the guys that got shot down to my fighter squadron, that guy was at camp. Well, we had, I've attacked that airfield twice. And uh, one time, uh, a guy named Matt Dillon, who uh, designed this shirt, it's got a, F-105 on this side, and it's got this. And uh, so Matt designed his shirt. Well, he was the force commander. He and Matt, he's unfortunately passed away. And uh, and so he, 
<clears throat> goes up there, and we had planned for a lifetime rolling. And uh, there was weather on the ground, and, uh, and, and it turned out as we were getting closer and closer to the airport, we realized that we're going to have a left rolling, and we were all in our formation the way we're supposed to be for a left hand rolling. But we wound up going to the south side of the airfield and roll in backwards. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and after it was all over with, and, and that turned out to be kind of a, a, a an interesting story because I, I was assigned to uh, drop a, a cluster bomb units on a, a AAA site on the south end of the airfield. And uh, three of my bombs were perfect. And then others opened up early and they were spread all around, but I, I actually hit the site. And um, other times I, I actually cratered the runway. And um, being a MiG airbase, you you would expect MiGs in the air. <laughs> and they were there. And uh, well, and, and Matt Dillon, who was this force commander, came in and rolled in, came off the target. He looked up and there was a MiG in the traffic pattern or heading towards the traffic pattern uh, to get on the ground. Uh, by that time, it was, it was too late for Matt to do anything, but there were MiGs all over the place. I personally didn't see any of them. <laughs> they were there, but I didn't see them. Uh, well, we started asking Matt. I said, hey, Matt, what happened? He said, uh, uh, we're planning for a left roll and, and we rolled in shallow from the, from the south side. He said, well, my attitude and my airspeed had all failed and I was just going by our little whiskey compass and, and flying the airplane. And, and I, it was a, he said, I wanted to just, I want, I was a force commander and I'm just going to, I'm just going in. And, and so and I, that one is, a, is very memorable uh, for a very different reason. T talking of MiGs then, you, you you referenced it earlier in the conversation. I think it's twenty seven and a half or twenty nine and a half is is the is the number then of of makes the F one hundred five got. Um, what was the what or was there a common factor in most of those kills? Was that just luck? Uh, was there how much of it was to do with pilot skill? How much of it was to do with the fact it's a simple M sixty one twenty millimeter Gatling gun and uh, not much to go wrong with it. What was the feeling amongst the F-105 community about why those kills came about? Well, in, in terms of being able to actually uh, getting into getting into a fight itself, uh, a, a big fight, it's, that's pretty much luck uh, because it's time and space. And if you happen to be there and they're there, you can get into a fight. If you're, you know, but if they're there and you ain't, well, nothing's going to go on. And, and so in that part, there's an awful lot of luck. Uh, and and uh, there's a fairly famous picture that uh, a guy named Ralph Kester, uh, who uh, uh, killed a MiG-17 with his uh, M-16 and actually wound up hitting the fuel tank. And, and, and there's a, a, you know, that picture is around in many different places. Well, it turns out he's got a PhD in aero engineering, and uh, it later became had gone through the fighter weapons school at Luke, and so he was an extraordinarily skilled pilot in the first place. He shot that MiG uh, just by looking at it and shooting at it. You know, in, in terms of having a lock on and the airplane, airplane doing things to help you hit the missile or hit the MiG, didn't have any of that. Um, there's a couple of guys in my squadron uh, that uh, uh, got into a, what they call a daisy chain. This is before I got there. Uh, and uh, one, of, one of the guys uh, was awarded a Air Force Cross. Um, and, um, but they got into a fight with a flight of uh, MiG 17s. And there was a MiG-17, F-105, MiG-17, F-105, and they're all in this great big, you know, everybody shooting at everybody else. And in the meantime, uh, another 
pilot comes down and he's going to fire at this MiG-17 and whew, there's an airplane goes right in front of him, a F-105. And the airplane just enveloped in flames. Well, it turns out he shot the fuel tank. And so the pilot just jettisoned the fuel tank and the airplane was fine. Well, it turned out it was his roommate. <laughs> I've seen a lot of MiG 17s, but I was, I was never in a position to be able to uh, get into a fight with them. They were generally saw them when they were going into a target area. And I was in these pod formations, or, or you know, and, and so there's there's no way I was going to break out of the, you know this formation to go out and chase a, a MiG somewhere. Uh, the, the other aircraft I did one time I take a shot at a MiG 21. Uh, it, it was. Uh, he had come in from behind us um, and uh, we fired at something else and uh, accelerator is accelerating away. And um, so I thought, I, uh, not much chance, but I'm going to shoot. And so uh, I was hoping I'd be able to see him on my gun camera film. Well, the gun camera, the, the, the camera film was just shaking so bad from firing the gun that you didn't see anything. <laughs> but I've been attacked several times by Meg, but generally they were out of position. Uh, there was one, one story I remember vividly uh, on the 3rd of January, 1967, 68, uh, we were in this pod formation and I was in the last uh, pod on the on the outside, and the lead was up here uh, in the, the first pod, then their second, third, and then fourth. Well, I saw this. I had really good eyesight those years, and uh, when I was at Nellis, the flight surgeon came in. He says, "All you guys got great vision, right?" Yeah. And uh, and, and the, the optometrist said. I might be able to help some of you guys if you're interested in. Uh, I, let me test you. So I thought, well, what the heck? So I went in there and uh, and I had a, well, I had 20/20 vision, but a, a smidge of astigmatism. And uh, by the time I walked out of there, he had given me a pair of the glasses. I had 20/10 vision, and and so I saw this mate coming, uh, red crown. The warning system told us that there was a MIG approaching. I saw it and uh, called it out to the flight. And uh, I, I saw him when he hit the afterburner, he did a little puff. I saw him when he dropped the fuel tank. I could see that come up. Saw him come down. He rolled out behind us and he rolled out in between the first and the number, uh, third pod. And it rolled out here and uh, rolled out right behind the, the number three guy uh, who uh, uh, on this flight that was called Scuba. And one of my squatter mates was Jim Croyer was sitting on the, on the outside wing and he called for the pilot to, to break. And, uh, and about that time, the, the MiG had already fired a missile and was absorption towards him. And instead of actually breaking, he turned the aircraft and he kicked tail to, to take a look at the missile. And uh, that, that was to, to see if he could see it. And uh, that, that was about the time the missile hit him. And, so uh, so well, you shot him down. He, he, he survived uh, the war, but he, he spent the war as a prisoner as a result of that. Did, did that atoll threat concern you? It's a fairly short range weapon. Okay. And uh, it's based on the same uh, configuration as a uh, sidewinder. And uh, it, you get a, when you're within range, uh, you, you hear a, a growling in the headset. And uh, if you're too close, you don't give time for the warhead to uh, uh, actually uh, be ready for detonation. <laughs> So there's there's some limits. So they're too far away and too close. That was their tactic, though, wasn't it? It was a slashing attack, uh, and and the atoll gave them that capability, didn't it? Because 
they didn't have to turn with anybody. They could come in, fly through a formation really fast. And yeah, that's exactly what they did. But that was a, a common tactic, and, uh, and and that changed over time too. Uh, uh, at one point of the during the war, the MiG 17s stayed down low, and the MiG 21s were up high. Uh, sometimes they'd switch, you know, and uh, or sometimes it'd be two MiG two uh, MiG 21s, one high, one low, hmm. and, uh, and, and but. Uh, I think most of that was occurring uh, before uh, I got into the fight because uh, uh, I normally saw one MiG and uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, their tactics changed after uh, uh, they, uh, the, that mission that uh, uh, where the F-4s uh, played the role of the F-105 took oh, our F-105 I've called it Operation Bolo, mm. and uh, they, they they shot down a lot of MiGs on that mission, and, 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 and they basically run out of the airplanes, and they stood everything down until they could sort the stuff out. So I think that all of that high low mix and all that stuff, I think that pretty much ended about the, that right after that, to my knowledge. But they did; they, they would do a lot of slashing attacks. That's there's no doubt about it. As, as a fighter pilot, what did you what did you come away with? Did you come away feeling validated? Did you come away feeling like you wanted to go back and do it again? You you talked about you know if you kept people there for a year, they wouldn't you know they wouldn't go home because they would end up dying. Did you did you go back? Uh, no, I did not. Um, I was ready to get on with the rest of my life. I had, when I went into combat, I had a a, a very young daughter. Uh, she was only three months old when I. When I, four, yeah, three months old when I first flew my first combat sortie. My next assignment was in uh, Kenina Air Base, Okinawa, and I was bringing my relatively new wife and her brand new daughter there. And I had you know, I had no desire to go back in there and mix it up again. Hmm. Uh, there were several guys that went back home flew the second tour. Uh, and some of them, uh, a few of them actually flew uh, two uh, 100 mission sorties and the F-105. There's not been not very many of them. Um, others went back in the F-4. Some guys went uh, from the F-105 D model to the we went through the Weasel School and went back into into battle during linebacker one and two as a, as Weasel pilots. By that time, uh, I was flying F-104s very merrily. Uh, and flying in a fire weapon school, and uh, and then went on to fly in the NATO units in Europe, flying in the Italian Air Force and in the German Air Force and Belgian Air Force and Dutch Air Force. Uh, they're very different, and they were uh, basically uh, sitting on nuclear alert. And I was a weapons evaluator. 